He used to be the treasurer. He still wants to be the treasurer again. And he's got some thoughts about how the treasury is being run in 38 Studios and all that tonight. Welcome in. Frank Caprio is my guest this evening. He put out a release earlier this week, I think, that said, hey, what's going on with this first Southwest thing? You know, this consultant to the state of Rhode Island on bonds and financing and all that kind of stuff that's actually also being sued by the state of Rhode Island over 38 studios. We're suing them on one side. We're hiring them on another side. And thus and such goes the saga of 38 studios in Rhode Island. So we'll talk to Frank about that and a whole bunch more coming up. Let's go to the rundown and see what we got here. Yeah, you know what? It just dawned on me this morning as I was going through a whole bunch of stuff on that 38 studios thing that it's time to cry for help. I'll explain what I mean about that. And by the way, a couple of other legislative moves kind of sneaky and uh, not very highly covered. Good catch by my producer today. Uh, big question for you, perhaps for 2018. And the slow wearing down of the money we make from gambling. Yeah, new formula proposed by Twin River. And while we're all immersed in following some of the controversies, know that the teacher unions are still in there swinging. Populations. Some towns have grown. Some towns have lost population. There's a couple of easy things to fix that if you're losing population. And, yeah, shucks. Oh, well, I thought we might have another series around here. Let's go to it. Jess brings me to issue number one, time for help. This is what I was thinking. You know, did you see yesterday that the, the, the Tim White broke a big story? It's a long Target 12 piece, and I don't have time to replay that this evening. But former Speaker Murphy uh, was found to have visited 38 studios in 2009, which you know, is a new add-on to the number of people that have been, you know, involved in a relationship with 38 Studios. Uh, I don't believe for a second that Bill Murphy just made an introduction to the Speaker of the House in Massachusetts for Curt Schilling. By the way, why was Curt, why did Curt Schilling, the Red Sox hero, need an introduction from the Rhode Island Speaker of the House to meet the Massachusetts Speaker? Uh, hold off on that picture. We'll get to that in just a second. Um, because that's the Attorney General. That ain't the Massachusetts Speaker. Uh, that's our Attorney General. But I was thinking in the midst of all of this, uh, you know, Murphy now in, and we've got litigation going on, and we've got a House Oversight Committee trying to get some traction, and we've got raids of the now former Speaker's office, I'm talking Fox, that we don't know are 38 Studios related, but maybe we got a state police confirmation that they're looking into 38 Studios, but we have an attorney general, there he is, usually find him on a milk carton uh, because he's missing in action all the time, who's doing nothing. I think that the people, that means you, by the way, at home, need to start peppering your state representatives and senators to start a conversation, if only a resolution, to ask for a special prosecutor in this 38 Studios situation, a special investigator, maybe sanctioned by the Attorney General's office working in cooperation with the police, uh, the state police, because this guy killed Martin, is completely asleep at the switch, he's part of the old boy network, and he's part of the democratic um, momentum to just kind of like, let's fix this, pay the debt on 38 Studios, and be done with asking any more questions. I don't think they're gonna be able to pull that off. There are too many enterprising journalists, Tim White et al., Ted Nisi, those kind of guys, Dan McGowan, here at our home base and others and that, are, that are asking very serious questions. Uh, me too, by the way. Uh, so it's not gonna die. But don't you get this feeling that we don't have a home base that we can trust investigatively on this whole thing? Somebody that's got a 30,000 foot view of the whole situation. We need somebody outside all Playerville here, perhaps from outside of Rhode Island to come in here and start looking at this. My idea, we'll see if it catches fire. Who knows? In the meantime, Nick Mattiello, the House Speaker now, uh, went to New York yesterday to talk to the Moody's and Standard & Poor's people about you know, paying this debt and, you know, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, you know, what would happen if we don't? He came back, told Eyewitness News yesterday afternoon. It was a very fruitful exercise. I think it was important that we went down to New York. Uh, it, it was a, a very fruitful fact-finding uh, effort. Um, it gave me a lot of perspective. It gave, it gave the leader a lot of perspective, and, and it helps us to 
make a determination of what our decision should be. Mattiello tells us he and Majority Leader John DeSimone spoke to Moody's and Standard & Poor's about the possible consequences Rhode Island would face if lawmakers refuse to pay back $90 million. No one else in the chamber makes that decision in isolation or, or alone, so we're going to collaborate with our members. Yeah, collaborate with the members. So they're having a caucus this afternoon. In fact, as we record the program, we do this in the early, in the late afternoon, by the way, uh, they're caucusing. So you may have already seen some news about what they're coming out with. But my guess is Nick Mattiello is going to fold. He's going to pay this debt. Uh, our guest tonight might think that's a good move, too, for other reasons. But uh, he's also one of the Democratic players. I, I will tell you that uh, um, knowing that Bill Murphy is, is in this soup, too, now, and how close Nick Mattiello and Bill Murphy are. <sighs> I, 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 whatever. Uh, we'll see tomorrow. But it doesn't look good for any of us who want to see the truth come out in this whole story. All right. Um, sneaky little move. Yeah. So Jess and I were talking this morning, or actually she sent me an email in our prep. I don't remember which. We do a lot of communicating. Uh, you want to talk about this whole lieutenant governor governor thing? I said, what are you talking about? She said, did you see the paper? I said, what paper? Wait, the Providence Journal? I said, where? So this little tiny story, we got this, this little tiny story, the General Assembly Digest, and then the little tiny story in the little tiny story. The Senate yesterday, voila, pop. The Senate yesterday passed this bill and sent it to the House to combine the governor and lieutenant governor's positions on a ticket beginning in 2018, the next four-year cycle to elect a governor and lieutenant governor. I have to tell you, I look at it, I'm kind of a political animal, right? So I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, how do I feel about this? And I had this incredible, you know, feeling of complete ambivalence about it. And then I asked my radio listeners about it on WPRO weekdays, noon to three. And you know how many calls I got on that issue? 0, 0.0. I think we're a little distracted. So, you know what? Do whatever you want. Post the question. We got four years. Actually, we got four months in November 2014 to figure out what we want to do in 2018. Meanwhile, we got people who want to end the lieutenant governor's office. I think that might be a better decision now that I think about it. All right, next item. Uh, yeah, they are. They're wearing us down. Real quick, let me just think about this one. On the headline, Twin River wants the state to increase the subsidy for marketing. Right now, follow this. Twin River puts in the first $4 million of its marketing budget itself, okay? And then up to $10 million, the state shares that expense up to $3.7 million. Are you following? Now Twin River would like to raise their marketing budget, in quotes, to $20 million by saying between $10 and $14 million, we'll put the first $4 million in, but then you share again up to $20 million, which would put the state's um, input to $7.3 million dollars. And there's a dispute because the state lottery head, uh, Mr. Aubin, says, you know, I don't, you know, they, they call a lot of things marketing expense. I'm not so sure about this one. It's Twin River chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, trying to find every little piece of our revenue that they can. I don't blame them, but there needs to be necessary friction between Twin River and the state, and I don't see enough of it. We'll see how this transpires. Yes, no, that while we're all confused and wondering about big money issues and controversies and raids and all sorts of other big time stuff coming about our state house, the unions are in there grinding. The House of Representatives committee yesterday passed a bill that delays teacher evaluations. Look, uh, all I know is this, if you're a great teacher, you don't mind being evaluated. Process, I get, can only always be argued, but the idea that the unions are always trying to lessen the pressure on their professionals should not be lost on us, the voters. So pay attention. I hope they don't slip this thing through. The Ed Commissioner is fit to be tied over it, and you should be too. And I think, finally, is this, no, 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 one more, one more item of, of concern. The ebb and flow of our population. Interesting front page story in the Providence Journal today about this. These are some of the towns that are growing and losing population. We've got a little chart for you here as an example of the towns that are growing and the towns that are not. We have that chart here somewhere. Yes, West Greenwich up 7.9% in population. North Smithfield and South Kingstown up and down. Newport, Warren, and Bristol. Hey, listen, there's a simple formula, and here's a, here it is. Great schools, 
good roads, good fire and police, good DPW, lower taxes. That's how you keep and gain population. And if you don't have it, that's how you lose it. And speaking of losing it, ah, I thought we'd have some more hockey. P. Bruins were down five goals last night at Wilkes-Barre, Scranton, and they scored four in the last, what, 22 minutes? But it wasn't enough. They're out. No more hockey in Southern New England. I'm so sorry to tell you that. Unless you're a Ranger fan, you can come over on our side. We're up 2 nothing over Montreal, who you hate. When we come back, Frank Caprio. He and I talk sports usually when we start the show anyway. We'll be right back. So this was an interesting headline. Of course, this is not new news, but when it crystallized in the headline, it makes you go, really? That doesn't make any sense. Look at this. State rehires a company that they sued. <laughs> All right, so our former treasurer and gubernatorial candidate, and now a candidate for treasurer again, Mr. Caprio is here. How are you, kiddo? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. You put out a press release on this first Southwest Lincoln, Rhode Island based consultant company that has been a longtime player in the bond analysis game here in Rhode Island, and you said some strong things about it. Tell me. Well, we have a financial advisory firm. That's a national firm. They have hundreds of people that work for them across the country. They have a Lincoln office. And they have a, they have right. a, yeah, they have right. a Rhode Island office. Right. They represent different uh, government entities here locally. And they advised the 38 uh, Studios deal. Uh, they were the financial advisor for Economic Development, Rhode Island Economic Development Corporation. Um, we now know that there's a lawsuit that was brought against all the advisors that worked on that deal, law firms, bankers and financial advisors for Southwest claiming such things as fraud, malpractice, negligence, misrepresentation, etc. Well, First Southwest has another contract with the state of Rhode Island to advise when the state borrows money. And that contract was up for an open bid. So they tried to keep the contract and another national firm that happens to be uh, highly ranked um, and in most rankings the top national firm for financial advisory work also bid. Well the state of Rhode Island I guess decided that taking advice from a firm that they're saying committed fraud, uh, yeah. negligence, malpractice That's is great. who we should advise them going forward. Now if that were you or I and we were sitting in the coffee shop right now and I was telling you Dan you know I had a, I had a group put an addition on my house and they never finished it and the house is, is, is leaning one way. Good, I'll hire him. And, and yeah, no, right. no, no, not right. you hire him. Right. I'm going to do a second edition, and I'm going to hire him <laughs> while I'm suing him for the well, work they just didn't I, finish. I, I get the now. It's almost, it's almost pure. Let's go backwards for a second. What's your experience with First Southwest? They've been, they've been involved with the state treasury for a long time. Yeah. They worked when you, they, they give you bond advice, did they not? When First Southwest has been the advisor to the state for over a decade. They do a good job when you were in the office? I'll tell you this. I worked with them um, in an arm's length uh, way. Did I take their advice? Yes. Did I have heated debates with them? Yes. Did we issue a lot of bonds and save the state money? Yes. Um, Again, a professional national firm, no doubt about it. However, that all changes when 38 Studios happens. And you know, see, I feel very strongly about this because when that deal was being finalized, I was the state treasurer. The state treasurer has nothing to do with the Economic Development Corporation when they issue bonds. The state treasurer doesn't have to sign off on it, doesn't, is not involved. But that 38 Studios deal was so bad when all the details started to come out. I said to the board, don't go forward. Wait until after the governor's election and the legislative election so the new people can decide if they want to do this. And, and First Southwest was advising the board. I also went to the rating agencies, First uh, Moody's and Standard & Poor's, and in an unprecedented way, I went right to them as state treasurer and said, there's this 38 Studios deal. You are being asked to rate the bonds. Don't rate the bonds. They went forward and rated the bonds. Why? Because they get paid and they were listening to First Southwest and the board of directors. First Southwest, in part of the lawsuit, when I made that request to the board, wait, wait until after the election, one of the counts in the lawsuit says that they misrepresented to the board that waiting 
would have cost a lot of money and would have killed the deal. Not true. So when it comes to First Southwest, I have some specific issues, especially on this 30 okay. years issue. Well, you're, you're, you're strong and you're animated about it, and so it tells me that, you're, A, you're informed, and, B, you got a good point of view. Do, do you think the lawsuit in its totality is legit? Because I'm not so sure it is on, on X number of levels. There's a lot of game playing going on with this litigation. Well, I'm not, I'm not in, involved in the, uh, you know, in the back a, and forth. From a, from yeah, a from, from from bird's from, eye view. From what I've read, um, you have Wells Fargo, a big uh, investment bank, and Barclays, another big investment bank, and First Southwest, and some law firms. And you have a document that was put out with certain facts in it, like that IBM had been hired to monitor the progression of the video game. Where were game. they? IBM was not hired by the Economic Development Corporation. So that, on its face, is not true, was a misrepresentation, misrepresentation to the bond market. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised that the Securities Exchange Commission comes down relatively soon with a pretty hefty fine for the work that, or, or, and the misdeeds that were done in, in that document. Now that sets the stage for the lawsuit. Okay, it's, uh, I know that a lot of you are on the couch going, man, this is in the weeds. But the weeds are where all the, you know, the weeds are where, it's in the weeds. When we come back, the simple question, do we pay this debt? The capital has a thought on that. Stay tuned for it. Do I believe they were being frank and honest with us? Yes. Do I trust them? I have no, no reason to trust anybody down there as I don't personally know them. But do I believe that we had an honest, frank discussion? Yes, I, I would say that. And I would say that the three other people that were with me would, would say the same thing. That is Nick Mattiello, the Speaker of the House, reflecting at WPRO this morning over his visit to New York yesterday to talk with Standard & Poor's and Moody's, a trip that Frank Caprio certainly understands, uh, as to whether or not uh, to get some advice or counsel, perspective, whatever, context on whether or not we ought to pay $12 million a year for the next seven years on principal and interest on the 38 Studios debt to the bondholders. Uh, what is your take on this? What is, what is your short answer on whether or not we should pay this debt? Personally, I think we should try and save as much money as possible. The only way to do that is to wait and not pay anything right now. Let the federal investigation work its way through. Let the civil suit work its way through. Let all the other well, We don't know if it's a federal investigation. The feds are out of 38 Studios, so they say. The state police are in. The attorney general is on a milk carton. By the way, fellow Democrat that he is, don't you think that we could get a more engaged attorney general in this particular case, get a Democrat. I don't, or I don't care if he's a Republican or if he's purple or orange. Could you get an AG that actually gets engaged in this and has and gives some some spiritual leadership? I know you're not running for that office, but do you have a perspective? But, but as far as the investigation, I believe that one of the uh, defendants' lawyers in court said that a hundred subpoenas had been sent sent out in a. Uh, federal yeah. and yeah. state Well, investigation. The, the lawyer for Gordon Fox did. Uh, you know, so, whether he's faking left going right in the court, I don't know. Point is, good dodge. Anyway, get back to it. Should we say, should we, so you want to wait? You want to see how things here, meet out? Here's, here's what I think, Dan. By not sending down uh, 12 million of taxpayers' money to, to Wall Street, you and I, I think within a few weeks, could negotiate a lot of savings for the state. What, when I say, you know, skilled people well, that, that want to dig in. A short guarantee is going to owe, if the state doesn't make this payment, is going to owe 12 million and potentially up to 80 million over the next seven years. Uh, uh, so you know, a short guarantee is the is the insurance company to the state of Rhode Island on this on on the potential default. So, if a short guarantee was sitting in the studio right now, and the legislature said we're not going to do anything right now, they're potentially out 80 million dollars. If the state leaders then called them and said, let's talk, let's resolve this, and let's bring the bondholders in, and let's sit them around the table. We don't know who all the bondholders are. But they'll show up mm. once they yeah. understand it's that the mind. check's not coming. And the bondholders have already received close to $30 million. That's one fact that doesn't get highlighted that much. Right. So if, if the people who bought the bonds who spent $75 million have received almost 30 already, let's sit down with them and say, Instead of saying that we owe you much more money, we paid you 30, you paid 75. We look at it like we only owe you 45 more. Forget about all this interest and everything. Let, let's resolve this once and for all. I'm just saying, that's a discussion that should be had. Amen, brother.
but we don't hear that kind of leadership right now. Well, that's, Dan, that's what this election's about. You need someone to stand up, be a leader, have the courage to do these things, have the experience and the knowledge well, you to think do Matty them. Well, like I, I wonder if Matty Yellow came back with that perspective. But short answer, because I only got a minute. Do you think mm -hmm. a, a lawyer who's the House Speaker for a couple of months has the savvy to understand what those guys yeah. are doing down there? I'm ready, to, I'm ready to step in at the appropriate time and help the legislature. I think they're doing the right things by digging in, going down there, getting as much information as possible. I think the issue they're dealing with is the compressed timetable and the reality that there's a lot of other issues in the state. I mean, I saw headlines today that we have a budget deficit that's growing by tens of millions uh, every week. So, so this issue may, in the big scheme of things for the legislature, not be something that they're willing to, uh, you know, fight every the, the last battle over. But the good thing, I think, for the future, is that there's still six, seven years of payments that need to be made. And, and you have, to, I have, and the you have to authorize them every year. Yeah, if I'm, in the, if I'm given the privilege of, of representing the people of the state of Rhode Island, I will make it my pr number one priority to save as much money as possible on this deal as we just uh, went over. All right. We'll talk more. Good to see you. Good to see you. Frank Caprio, yeah. your state of mind when we come back. Stay with this is how you get in touch with the broadcast, of course. Your state of mind is important to us. Phone us. Voicemail, air you, state of mind, email, Facebook post, the like. Here's one on our discussion with the general yesterday on the VA and our care for the soldiers, retired, of course. This is a story from Ray. He's just talking about his scripts and the bottom line of it, as you read through, he says, look, you know what? Right now, I go to CVS and I'm handled a lot cheaper and a lot better. That's not good. You know, we got to clean up this whole VA thing. Hopefully the investigation the president is launching is legitimate, and it's a bad precursor to what Obamacare could be in a big way across this country if it gets any larger. Anyway, we'll see you tomorrow on the radio at noon, and right back here tomorrow night, 7.30 on My Ride TV.